Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for having us. We could not be more excited to be here. Um, this is my first time in Oregon, and I love it. Um, it's been great. We got here last Sunday night, and since then, Sarah and I have been traveling all through the Willamette Valley and down south and in, on the coast, and Mary's been out east, and we've seen so much of the state, and it's been just really amazing. Uh, we've met so many great people and had so many good events, actually, just like this one all over the state, and we really believe um, now more than ever that Oregon can be the next state to lead the way on healthcare for this country. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> You know, part of the reason why we're here um, is because from the beginning of the Healthcare as a Human Right campaign uh, in Vermont, we knew that this couldn't just be a victory for Vermont. Uh, what we really need in this country um, is a national health care system, a national system that puts people first and treats health care as a human right. But it became really clear to us right away that that wasn't going to happen at this time. And that states really needed to lead the way and set the example. Um, but it can't just be a victory for Vermont, and it won't be a victory unless other states soon follow the lead and create your own state-based universal health care system that can build the groundwork for a national health care plan. We also realized that this couldn't just be a victory for health care. That the reason why our health care system doesn't work for us is because right now, we have a democracy that doesn't work for us. Yeah. Our story is the story of people coming together to have our voices heard and to create a real democracy where people have a say in the decisions that affect their lives. This victory is a people's victory. And so we're here today to share with you what we did to make it happen, the lessons we learned, and how we can um, work together to build a national campaign for universal health care. Awesome. Yay. So we wanted to just give you a little bit of background um, first about the Vermont Workers Center. So um, we are a democratic member-run organization. Uh, we wanted to share with you our strategic orientation because it's been a guide, um, like Kate said, um, for how we build a real democracy, not just change healthcare policy, but build a whole government system that works for the people. So we believe that the most effective means of change is people engaging in collective struggle to place direct pressure upon those uh, who hold power or make the decisions that affect our lives. Um, so that's a really important part of our identity at the Worker Center. Um, and we also, we're not just a healthcare organization, we work on all different issues that, um, that affect working class people in Vermont, which we define pretty broadly, you know, we're, the 99% is the working class. And so we, uh, we're also a Jobs with Justice chapter, we come out of the labor movement, and we struggled on all different issues in Vermont, um, including uh, livable wage campaigns, which have helped bring up the minimum wage in Vermont. Um, we've struggled to keep schools open in our low-income neighborhoods in Burlington, our biggest city. Uh, we have, have fought for tenants' rights and done lots and lots of labor solidarity um, and helped keep our union strong in Vermont as well. Um, but a few years ago, we realized that healthcare was an issue that was touching all of the other issues that we worked on and was pretty much the biggest issue facing working class Vermonters. Um, so, you know, we were seeing that when we were supporting unions in their contract struggles, they weren't even able to negotiate on wages and working conditions because the whole negotiation was taken up by healthcare. Um, we were seeing that the public services that, are, that people in our communities depend on were being rolled back and they were saying it was because the cost of healthcare for public employees was so high. Um, you know, we were seeing that people were losing their homes because there was a housing crisis because of the healthcare crisis, because people had so much medical debt that they were going into bankruptcy and losing their homes. Um, and then on top of that, healthcare was its own issue itself and, and people couldn't get the care that they needed. Uh, we also have a workers' rights hotline at the Workers' Center that basically became a healthcare hotline. Everybody's issues were connected to healthcare. Um, so we realized that we needed a people's movement to do something about this system that was really um, affecting us and that, that, um, that healthcare was just central to everything that we fought on. So we decided to dedicate our organization to, to changing what was politically possible on healthcare in Vermont and that's what we've done. So we're actually going to start um, by showing, thanks. Uh, we're actually going to start by showing a couple quick videos because this has not just been the three of us, you know, struggling for healthcare in Vermont. This has been a movement of hundreds and thousands of Vermonters, and we just can't 
tell that the way that we can show it. So we're going to start. Um, these videos are a little bit out of date at this point, um, so we'll give an update afterwards. But there will be one video, and then we'll show the next video that's sort of an update. So um, please enjoy, and, and um, hopefully, you know, the many Vermonters who have made this possible can tell their story through these videos. My name is Michael Barkoff. I've been without health insurance for 20 years. These people are dedicated members of the community that don't have insurance. I do not want to have to justify to insurance companies that I want better quality of life and have to tell them or have them tell me it's too expensive. I've gone for an MRI, which I debated on for so long, and have the bill for that, and the bill for this, and that, and a whole bunch of other things sitting on my kitchen table at home. What I find so frustrating about my job is that probably at least 50% of the patients that I take care of never should have ended up in the ICU. I can't afford treatment if it is serious. If I go and find out that this is cancer, I've essentially bankrupted my family. On the other hand, if I don't go get treatment and it's cancer, I've left them without a dad. As a self-employed carpenter struggling to make ends meet for many years, I had to choose between being homeless or having health insurance. I can't, I just can't afford them. You do the math, and the money's just not there. Having to choose between their kids' college education, mortgage, heat, um, it's just devastating. I do not want to have to choose between buying medicine and buying groceries for the week. And suddenly we were part of what I guess is called the underinsured. It's hard enough emotionally, physically, living with pain every day without having to worry about how I'm going to get out of debt. I am not a price tag. I am not... My val the value of my life is not a tax burden. They come in for infections that they noticed possibly a week or two before, but delay care because they already have overwhelming medical bills. The deductible was $5,000. That meant that we had to spend $13,000 before we would ever get a cent of reimbursement. Before I knew it, I was medically bankrupt. I've seen people with diabetes, even well-managed diabetes, that ignore small ulcers on their feet that are easily treatable, but they can't get treatment for because they don't have insurance, and they end up losing their foot, sometimes their entire leg. Tens of thousands of people are suffering, dying, and living in fear needlessly every year. That a healthcare system based on corporate greed has given us all too much human suffering. Uh, there is no question uh, that the system that we have now is broken. It's fundamentally broken and it's a mess. It must not be that you're at the doctor's office and you're trying to figure out how to pay. I'm here because this is, this is my reality, this is what I deal with, and I'm here for everyone else who's dealing with it too. Our problem is that we're spending money for profits, for bureaucracy, for advertising, for billing. We're not spending it where we need it, for doctors, nurses, medicine, healthcare professionals. We've got to change our healthcare priorities. Now we need a rational way to finance healthcare. Each of these insurance companies has a different rules, reimbursement, and regulations. And this is just one primary care office. Now you can imagine why, with all of this, we spend an enormous amount of money on administration. Our current health care financing system, based largely on employer-sponsored private insurance, is unsustainable. We need a system that puts providing this care first. Health care is not a commodity, but a public good. We look at our schools as a public good, our police departments, our fire departments. Why is it that we can't look at health care in the same way? We say we can and we should. The current system of market-based health care financing cannot merely be tweaked piece by piece because it has the wrong goal. The function of a private health insurance company is not to provide health care, it is to make money. And that is the system that we have got to end.
What do we mean when we say that healthcare in particular is a human right? Here we have some five principles that we feel that comprise what having healthcare as a human right is about. Universality, equity, accountability, transparency, and participation. Everybody must be covered. Nobody left out. Healthcare resources and services must be distributed according to people's needs, as opposed to payment, privilege, or any other factor. There must be means of holding government accountable for failing to meet human rights standards. Government must be open with regard to information and decision-making processes. That governments engage people and support their participation in decisions about how their human rights are to be ensured. A healthcare system that satisfies these principles is the responsibility of government to ensure. The goal of the Healthcare as a Human Right campaign is to witness, in practice, meaningful healthcare reform that embodies the human rights principles that have been just described. We would like to see the right to healthcare embedded in law. In 2010, we're pushing for action on two bills already mentioned this evening that have been introduced that will help facilitate the implementation of healthcare policies based upon human rights principles H100 and S88 in the Senate. Face to face, grassroots organizing is the only way we can ever leverage enough power to beat their money. To seek health care is a human right. So we have this campaign that means to take health care as a human right out of the abstract and move it into the concrete world as health care is a human right by Vermont law. That is our goal. To make this a reality in our country, we launched the campaign about a year and a half ago with a series of hearings. Some of you folks may have been at those hearings. We also did surveys and collected stories from Vermonters about how the healthcare crisis is affecting all of us. On May 1st of last year, we held the biggest weekday rally in the history of the state, where over a thousand Vermonters came out to the State House, um, flooded the State House with supporters. Now is the time to demand that our government do our will without interference from any corporation, and they must create a real health care system. And we're continuing this historic campaign by having a series of people's forums. We held people's forums on health care all over the state. Over 800 people participated, over 70 legislators. Hundreds of people wearing bright red t-shirts proclaiming that health care is a human right crammed into a large meeting room at the State House. What I would say to our legislature is that we are here to do the hard work with you in moving Vermont forward to recognizing health care as a human right. We are looking to our elected representatives to overcome obstacles, not to use obstacles as excuses for inaction. It's time for you guys to please do something. Let's save some lives. People are dying. We gotta fix it. Please, you guys are the guys to do it. It is time for Vermont to lead the way. I think that if the state of Vermont does the single payer system well as I know we can, you're gonna have New York State, New Hampshire, Connecticut, every other state in this country looking at us, wanting it, and then you're gonna have a national single payer program. And what we heard loud and clear in communities across Vermont is that the time is now for change on health care. It is time for Vermont's elected representatives to recognize, as the people of Vermont do, that health care is a human right. Hear them talking tongues, child. No, 
you know now what they mean Ain't gonna make no kind of difference Just keep your eyes focused on the screen Yes, I guess I see They ain't doing nothing here But leeching off for you and me Well, yes, I guess I know no place left on this earth that I could call my own and yes I hope I see the day we all wake up and stop Since its launch in 2008, the Healthcare is a Human Right campaign has transformed the political landscape in Vermont. Together, we have changed what is politically possible in healthcare reform by mobilizing thousands of Vermonters to speak out and demand their human right to healthcare. A universal, equitable healthcare system is now within our reach. We made great strides in 2010. First, we descended on the State House with thousands of petitions and with our own answer to professional lobbyists, the People's Team. The team reported back to Vermonters on what's going on in the State House and helped us hold our legislators accountable. In communities across the state, our local organizing committees mobilized their families and neighbors, held public events, and educated our elected officials on the need to provide health care as a public good to all Vermonters. As a result of this organizing, legislators began to debate real health care reform. A bill that later became Act 128 committed Vermont to treating health care as a public good. It included all of the principles put forward by the Health Care as a Human Right campaign. Universality, equity, accountability, transparency, and participation. On May 1st, 2010, over a thousand Vermonters converged at the State House to call for the passage of a universal health care bill. A few weeks later, Act 128 was passed and signed into law. The Healthcare is a Human Right campaign had achieved its first legislative victory. But we got right back to work, mobilizing more and more Vermonters. During the 2010 election season, we held 15 people's forums all over the state, attended by over 130 candidates and many hundreds of Vermonters. Our message was heard loud and clear at the ballot box when Vermonters elected Governor Shumlin who ran on a universal health care platform. In January 2011, we once again kicked off the legislative session by packing the State House and delivering a petition signed by over 4,000 Vermonters demanding real health care reform. As a result of our organizing, universal health care was on everyone's mind. Meanwhile, Dr. Shao of Harvard University had been selected to develop the plans for a new health system as called for by Act 128. Soon after the start of the legislative session, Dr. Shao presented his proposal for a single-payer system to the Vermont Legislature in a room packed with health care as a human rights supporters. On the heels of Dr. Shao's report, the governor introduced a health care bill designed as a roadmap for a universal health care system. In response, our campaign has mobilized across the state to strengthen this bill. Hundreds of Vermonters testified that this bill must create a universal, equitable health care system that provides health care as a public good for all. Over the next weeks and months, we will be redoubling our efforts to counter the scare tactics employed by deep-pocketed health insurance profiteers and their allies. Now more than ever, we need to keep organizing and building our movement for a health care system that works for the people, not for corporations. Vermont can lead the way by creating a universal health care system that provides health care as a public good for all. This May Day, join us for the biggest health care as a human right rally that Montpelier has ever seen. Bring your friends and family and speak out against the insurance industry and for our human right to health care. Join us. For more information, go to www.healthcareisahumanright.org.
So as Sarah mentioned, that film was a little out of date, and we did, in fact, have the biggest health care as a human right rally that Montpelier has ever seen, and we did pass a law that creates a universal health care system in Vermont. <laughs> After years of organizing, we created a health care system that is universal, publicly financed, and embeds in law the human right to health care. And it commits uh, the state of Vermont to providing health care as a public good. In a time when our public goods are constantly under attack, and the trend in this country is take away public services and peel back public goods and victories for the public sector, um, we have expanded our public sector in Vermont, and we have expanded the things that we consider to be human rights and public goods. This is a huge victory. And when Act 48 passed, it was because every human being could embrace the human rights principles. They cut across all divides, everything that our opponents usually use to separate us. And they stressed our mutual humanity and the fact that we are suffering human beings. That cuts across all classes, religious, ethnicity, and the people of Vermont said to our legislators, this is a democracy. You work for us. And they got Act 48 passed, which had really important language by embedding our human rights principles. For, as a matter of fact, it specifically says that we get comprehensive, affordable, high quality, publicly financed, health care for all Vermont residents in a seamless and equitable manner regardless of income, assets, health status, or availability of health coverage. The reason that's important is that one, it identifies health care as a public good just like our fire departments. It identifies that it will be publicly financed just like all of our other public goods. And third, it embeds equity in the law. And there are really two kinds of equity that we're talking about here. One is equity of access. And that doesn't mean that we all get the same, and it doesn't mean that we get what's fair. It means each person gets what they need when they need it. Because I don't need the same as you need, you don't need the same as you need. So we each get treated as humans and individuals, and each get what we want. Then there's equity of financing, which is even more important, and really easy to understand in just a few words. You pay as you can afford to. So, there are some people that can afford to pay more, and they'll pay more. Some people that can't pay anything, and they won't. But we'll all get what we need, when we need it, because we know that as a society, we need each other to live, and we need, to, need each other to be healthy in order to be a productive society. The second point is that the state will achieve health care reform through the efforts of an independent board, state government, and Vermonters with input from health care professionals, businesses, and the people. And there is another provision that we don't have quoted up here in the law, which says it will be decoupled from employment. And that's very important and very crucial. So our principles are really what allowed the people to win the battle. Because the people embraced those principles, and it doesn't matter what kind of education you have or don't have, and it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, these are five principles that everybody can embrace. You already heard them described in the film, but I'm going to give you just like a one-sentence definition of each one. Universality. If you're human, you get it. Everybody can understand that. Equity in access. You get what you need when you, want, when you need it. Equity in financing. You pay according to your ability. Accountability. The system works for us we get to hold it accountable for whether or not it's working for us. 
Our legislators work for us, and we get to hold them accountable if our health system isn't working. So every aspect of this law that's put into effect has to meet these principles. Transparency, that's really clear. It is clear. <laughs> Everything has to be clear. No secret combinations, no locks. We need to be able to see what our health system gives us and know how to get it. And participation. And isn't that, after all, what our whole democracy is about? It's certainly supposed to be. We get to be the voters. We get to be the ones that hire the government. So we get to participate in this health system that's designed to serve our needs. This is us telling them what we need. It's a bottom-up power structure where we say, here's what we need. You write the law and we'll tell you if it's good enough. And public good, that it is in fact a public good. We all need know that we need to be healthy to be productive in our society. So Vermont's principled wins were a breakthrough in not only human rights, but in democracy for the people. So um, we came not just to tell you about what we did, but about how we did it and what we've learned. Because we have been uh, struggling for health care for the, for the past three and a half years in Vermont with thousands of people getting involved. And this has really, like we've mentioned over and over again, been a victory of the people. And so all of us, the people, have gotten together to boil down what did we learn from this campaign and from this process um, so that we can share that with everybody. Because like we've said, this needs to be uh, just one step in, in the long-term struggle for everybody to have access to all the things that they need and for, our pe for people to be put first. So we went around and we figured out what are the most important lessons that we can share across the country um, about how we were able to achieve this in Vermont. So lesson number one is that people's movements can redefine political priorities. So let me ask you something. Who here has heard somebody tell you that universal health care is not possible? <laughs> not possible, right. We heard that too. We heard it a lot, actually. Anybody who was anybody in Vermont was telling us that what we were trying to do was the impossible. Um, and what we really did with that is we um, did not take it, we did not back down, we did not get discouraged, but we really took that as a call to action that what that really meant was that our elected representatives were hearing more from our opponents, the people who currently profit off of our healthcare system, than they were hearing from us. And that meant to us that we needed to get organized and we needed to have a voice that was bigger and stronger than they did. When we first started the Healthcare is a Human Right campaign, um, the person who you saw in the film, who is now our governor, Governor Shumlin, uh, was the president pro tem of the Senate in Vermont, uh, the state Senate. And he, uh, we, you know, we tried to sit down with him and have a conversation. The legislative session was coming up. We wanted to talk about what was going to happen on health care this year. And he told us, you know, nothing is going to happen on health care this year. We're not taking it up. And sure, um, you know, and he, at first he wouldn't even meet with us. And then finally we got him to sit down and meet with us. And what he said was that, you know, um, sounds like a good idea, sounds nice and everything. Wouldn't that be nice? But I'm a practical guy, and I don't think that's going to happen. And that's what we've all heard from a lot of people, right? So we, again, took that as a call to action, got organized, started building up our campaign, did a lot of the things that you saw in that video. And fast forward less than a year later, uh, then um, Senator Shumlin was announcing his run for governor. And he was announcing that he was running on a single payer platform <laughs> and that and that he was going around every day giving stump speeches saying, health care is a human right. And, using the words that we used in our campaign to talk about health care, and that was because we built the movement to change that political reality. All right. <laughs> All right. So lesson number two. A human rights framework can be extremely effective both for the organizing work and the policy work. So another thing that we heard a lot, and I'm sure people have heard this too, let me know. Have you heard that we need to talk about this issue in terms of cost containment and saving money? Right? We've all heard that. So we said, actually, this issue is not just about saving money. Even if it was going to cost us more money to make sure that every single person in our communities could go to the doctor when they need to, we would still have to make this happen. It is not, for us, we realize this is not about saving money. This is about justice in our communities and about every single person in Vermont and everywhere being able to access the health care that they need. So we said, yeah. 
So we said, so we decided that we were going to use a human rights framework. And not only was that better because it's what we believe, but it also turned out to really work. So we, uh, you know, we do a lot of organizing at the Vermont Worker Center. So when we went out there and knocked on doors of the people in our communities and we asked them, what does this healthcare crisis look like to you? And they told us pr pretty horrible stories. You all just did this together today. So when we hear these stories and we say, we have a campaign and it's called Healthcare is a Human Right. People understand immediately what that means and that, and that it reflects the issues that they're dealing with in their lives. That, they, that their human rights um, to healthcare are being denied right now and that there's an injustice happening. And so when we go out and we organize our communities, when we're talking about healthcare as a human right, it's really important because people can understand right away why that is a solution to, to the injustice that they're experiencing. Also, it works because we're not just mobilizing people and asking them to come show up for one rally. We're building deep, committed leaders for the long haul of this movement. And so when we talk about human rights, we talk about a system. And we talk about all the other things that aren't working for us in our communities. And, and we can build that analysis of, of injustice that we are going to need if we're all going to be in it for the long haul. And it works really well for the policy end of things, too. Because every one of you, just like every one of our Vermonters in our organizing committees, need to be able to talk about policy. Now, I happen to be sort of, you know, a retired attorney, so yeah, technical stuff doesn't bother me too much. But I also know it's not very clear for most people, and it's not clear for most of our legislators, because we need a very simple message, which we have in our five principles. So for policy fights, when people meet with their legislators, and when, even when the policy team meets with the legislators, there is always one message, and it's always on message. And they want to say, well, you know, it's a good idea, but you know, what about the cost? And we say, excuse me, this is a human rights crisis. The cost is in human lives. What is a human life worth? It allows us all to stay on message and to use those five principles in arguing any particular part of the act that we need to, because it all has to do with equity, transparency, universality, accountability, and public good. Awesome. And then also, we, we obviously love this human rights framework, <laughs> but another reason that it has been extremely effective um, is that we're not just fighting for one piece of legislation. So when we're fighting for healthcare as a human right, we're fighting for the whole system. And we can keep going. You know, we already have passed two different pieces of legislation in Vermont um, through this campaign. And we're going to have to pass health care legislation every year for a long time. And then once we have our health care system, we're going to have to keep standing up for it. You know, so we realize that, that a, health, a human rights framework helps us have the big picture of the whole system that we're fighting for. And one example of when this has already um, been extremely effective is that, and, and I've heard that this is happening here in Oregon too, in Vermont, um, our biggest hospital owns all of the dialysis units around the state. Um, so services that people really depend on. Uh, and they have decided that, they wanted to, that, that those dialysis units are not profitable enough. So they want to sell them off to a for-profit corporation based in another country um, to manage with horrible staffing ratios, anti-union, and you know, main accountability uh, mechanism is to its shareholders, not to the people of Vermont at all. So that obviously is not something that we were very excited about. So our campaign, because we have this human rights framework and because those human rights principles have already been put into law in Vermont, we were able to fight back against that sale and take it not just to the legislature, but to the banking and insurance board that regulates these types of sales. And we said to them, this goes against everything that our state has just put into law as the principles of our healthcare system, and we blocked that sale. So that, so, so our human rights principles went up against, our human rights principles went up against a very powerful corporation, and the people of Vermont won, because we have a principled campaign. So it's pretty important. So lesson number three is be prepared to counter divide and rule tactics. So what are some wedge issues, some divide and rule issues that we hear um, out there around healthcare that come up? Immigration. Immigration. 
Uh huh. <laughs> Just shout them out. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, okay, so we heard all of those things and more um, in our campaign. Um, and I'm going to take one example and tell a story about how immigration came up in Vermont. Um, and what happened was that, uh, you know, from the beginning of our campaign, we realized that there were going to be these divide and rule tactics. And because our strategy was organizing and standing together in solidarity, that the biggest weapon our opponents have against us is keeping us divided and fighting with each other rather than fighting with our real enemies. And one of the ways that our opponents do that, and time has told, um, is that um, they crack us along fault lines that already exist in our communities. So they exploit racism, sexism, ableism, ageism, all these um, systems of oppression that create fault lines in our communities, and they use those to take advantage of them and split us apart. And they certainly did this in Vermont. About a couple hours before um, the bill was to be voted on in the Senate, um, and to get on its way to be signed by the governor, um, two senators, a uh, Democrat and a Republican, one of them's Mary Senator, uh, uh, introduced an amendment to exclude undocumented people from our universal health care system. Yeah. And so what they hoped would happen was that the Health Care is a Human Right campaign would fracture. That some of us would say, no, get that amendment out, that's not right. And some of us would say, well, you know, don't we just want to get the bill passed and get it over with and just get it through? And then some of us would say all together that they supported the amendment and that we would all be all over the place and it would divide our campaign and that they would win and the bill wouldn't pass at all. Um, that's what they hoped happened, um, and it didn't happen that way. And part of the reason because it was because we started in the very beginning of the Healthcare as a Human Right campaign back in 2008 when we first launched it. The first thing we did was a tour of the state, and we did eight anti-racism trainings. Um, all over the state where we actually had members of our campaign practicing. So Mary and I would be in a room and practicing having a conversation about this issue for when it came up and why it was so important that we stood together in solidarity and didn't let it divide and rule us. Um, and so when the time came and that this, this bill got introduced, we were able to um, respond. And because we had been using pr human rights principles, it was pretty clear. Healthcare is a human right. There's no exceptions to that. Human equals human. And so we were able to stand up. All of our members understood that. We had practiced having conversations about it with each other. And so we could call our legislators and get right on the phone and tell them what we thought. We did petitions. We did um, phone calls to the legislators. We actually met in, um, in uh, we, we were in the room for the committee meetings as they were finaling, finalizing the bill. We did not leave literally till like 9 o'clock that night when they were fi finishing it. And they finally took that amendment out. And not only did they take the amendment out of the bill, but they replaced it with an amendment, a resolution that Vermont was going to look into the ways in which federal immigration policy negatively impacted Vermonters. Wow. And it actually, actually, Mary's right, it was actually one of the senators that had originally introduced the amendment supported the replacement amendment and introduced it to, um, we, we complete, it was a complete 180. And so this was all, we wouldn't have been able, that wouldn't have been possible if we weren't prepared. <laughs> okay, so we also learned that it's not just about having convincing arguments, it's about getting our communities organized statewide to stand up for justice. So how many people have heard uh, why universal health care is a good idea? We've probably heard that, right? How many people think our legislators have probably heard those arguments at some point, right? Right. So it doesn't mean that they're jumping up and down to uh, change our healthcare system. Is that correct? So it was the same thing in Vermont. There has been a, a single payer bill in Vermont every year for the past 20 years. And what changed in Vermont is not that we had a better argument than every other year before. It was that we were organized and we had the people power to change the political landscape so they had to do something about it. And that is, is fundamental. So it also is important for when we're going out there in our communities, we can't just change everybody's mind about universal health care. We can't just go out there and give, you know, and, and tell people the facts about why universal health care makes more sense. We have to organize. We, and that means we have to bring people in and ask them to do something. We have to ask them to take action and become part of our organizations so that we have the power, not just the opinion, to change what's happening in our, in our states and in our communities.
And the reason we have to organize, as I'm sure you know already from the videos and from the talks, is because it's our votes that we need to hold up and say, hey, you're not getting this if you don't do what we want. And it's really funny because I know a lot of people feel really disempowered lately. What can one vote do, right? I mean, I felt that way myself. But there's a little bit of a story about how the people of Vermont did it. And it's a lot like we all know that big business and insurance companies and lobbyists that are paid a lot of money have a lot of power. And if me, Mary says, hey, wait, guys, don't listen to all those millions of dollars over there. I'm over here. Well, I may be a human being, but that seems pretty powerful over there. But I'll tell you, when I was little, and um, I don't want you to think I was really mean. I didn't do this all the time. But I had a younger brother, and he's... So he was younger, he was smaller than I was. So you know the seesaw or teeter-totter at the park that you can play on? So if I put my younger brother on the end of the seesaw and then I jumped on, and there's my brother up there, right? And he's going, <laughs> he can't get down because he's way too small. Well, that's me when the insurance companies and the big business are down here on the teeter-totter. But if I grab Kate and Sarah, and 20 of you to get on that end of the teeter-totter with me, all of a sudden we're like tipping a little bit, right? If I get another thousand people and you get another thousand people, then we might be even. The teeter-totter's gonna even out. And a few more people, and guess who's up in the air then? The people that thought they had the power because they forgot that this is a democracy, and it's the people that have the power. And big business and lobbyists don't have a vote. We do, and we can do it, and you can do it. Okay, so another thing that we learned is that we need to tell our own stories. We believe, and, and I'm sure you have all experienced this, that there is a media blackout on the struggles in our communities, the crises that are happening in our communities, and the things that people are doing to, to fight back. Right? We don't turn on the news every day and hear stories about, the, you know, about your neighbor who might be losing their home because of medical bills. And we definitely don't turn on the news and, and hear about people coming together to make change. right? So, I mean, the, the national story that went out in Vermont in a lot of ways, right, or, uh, across the country about Vermont, is that our governor woke up one day and decided to pass universal health care, right? <laughs> That's pretty much the, the, what was in the headlines. Um, so we learned that we need to learn to make our own media um, and tell our own stories about both the crises that are happening and our struggles um, to change what's happening. So I want to tell a little story, show a little example. This, uh, this picture is from the day that our bill was signed, the, the bill that hundreds of Vermonters had fought for for years and years and years. There's our governor up front. There's uh, you know, his whole team of people in their suits. And you can see uh, around the back, there's a lot of people in red t-shirts. And actually, the whole crowd that was right you know, out front is all people from the Health Cares a Human Right campaign wearing their red Health Cares a Human Right t-shirts. Um, and the whole program of the bill, our governor, he thanked a whole lot of people. He thanked probably everybody he could think of. A lot of people that I've never even heard of. I don't know what they have to do with health care. But uh, he never thanked the Health Care is a Human Right campaign, the Vermont Workers Center, the people of Vermont. They were left, we were left out completely from this story. Not only by the governor uh, you know, in his program for the signing of the bill, but the picture that was in the paper the next day was pretty much cropped right about here and right over the governor's head. So there was not one red t-shirt in the picture that was in the paper um, as we ha passed this historic legislation in Vermont. And that was very intentional. That was not by accident that they cropped it there. Because, you know, and we, and we, we went back and we asked everybody, so why do you think they did that? Why do you think we were completely left out from the story? And what, what we heard from our members around the state is that if that story got told, if people knew that this happened because of a people's movement and because the people of Vermont came together and stood up for themselves and for their rights, that would be dangerous, right? People might actually do it if we all knew that that's how things happen, right? <laughs> so, 
So the media is not going to tell our stories for us, and we need to learn to make our own media, to have our own media infrastructure, and to be able to tell each other our stories in situations just like this, so that we know what, how change really happens. So now we're going to get into a little bit of the nuts and bolts of how to do this, because we can feel the energy in this room. You guys are all ready to do this here in Oregon and take, uh, build a campaign for universal health care right here. Um, so we're going to break down a few of the tactics and strategies we learned. Um, we, um, we had our campaign basically in three phases. The first pa phase was to build our base. Bef the first whole year of the campaign, we didn't go anywhere near the legislature. We just focused on organizing, talking to people, doing surveys. Um, building up um, the base and actually putting the system on trial, putting the healthcare system on trial and indicting it for not meeting our needs. And we did that through a series of tactics and uh, human rights hearings and things like that. In phase two, we began taking it to the legislature. Now we had the network of Vermonters that could stand up for our human rights and we could take it to the state house. And we began developing the principles and sort of this uh, system of holding um, healthcare legislation up to human rights principles to make sure that it would meet our needs and fight for it in the state house. And in the third phase of the campaign, we continued our legislative, we continued our legislative campaign, we continued to take it to our legislator and had our victory on Act 48 um, and continued to stay organized to make sure that as the process moves forward, we, um, we implement it in a way that works for Vermonters. So we are going to get into some of the nitty gritty nuts and bolts strategies and tactics that we use to do this. So we're going to talk a little bit about mass organizing, storytelling, engaging power holders on our own terms, education and leadership development, uh, the, our people's team and our policy committee, and statewide organizing. So we're going to go through each one of those a little bit. For mass organizing, we have a lot of different techniques, and the big motto is know your five principles and always be prepared. Because as we all know, movements are about relationships. And we need to seek out relationships and always have everything with us that we might possibly need to try and let people know about the importance of the healthcare struggle. And it all starts with looking at somebody in the face and looking at somebody in the eyes and knowing that you share something in common. So we have a lot of petitions and we have a lot of, we have postcards that say, I believe healthcare is a human right with the, your contact information. And we go to farmer's markets and midnight madness sales and the fireworks display, the community picnics, anywhere where there are a lot of people. And we talk to people and we say, hi, do you believe healthcare is a human right? And a lot of times people say, no. And we say, well, healthcare is a human right. So do you think some people shouldn't get healthcare? And they might say, that's right, I think some people shouldn't get healthcare. And then we say, well, which one of your friends or neighbors or relatives, are you going to choose not to have health care? Nobody can answer that. And they might walk away and they also might come back because we cannot look at another human being in the eyes, recognizing each other's humanity and say, I think it's okay if you die. We can't do it. We just can't do it. So. We have the petitions and we sent all those for both Act 128 and Act 48. And then we have also the Picture Healthcare as a Human Right campaign. And because we like to stress the human element, as in human rights, we decided that lots and lots of signatures are important. However, lots of pictures are even more important because that is a real face and a real person who has a real story. So we went to the farmer's markets and the firework displays and the churches and the community picnics and maybe the malls, depending on the part of the town. And this is a whiteboard. That's one of those dry erase boards. And on the top of that is the healthcare is a human rights sign that's always pasted on there. And on the bottom is a name and a town. These are people that have a vote. They're real honest goodness people. 
And we collected these photo petitions, and we put them together, all of them, and we also put them together by area, and sent them to the legislators saying, these people who vote, these people who have a story and are human beings, the ones that elect you, in other words, think healthcare is a human right. And this created a mass movement throughout the state. And it worked so well, in fact, when we were traveling the other day, I'm gonna tell a little story about uh, what our wonderful group that escorted me up the East Coast did, which was to actually talk to a waitress in a restaurant where we were and ask her about her, her health care situation. And she happened to be a single mom with a two-year-old, and she was a wait person and was very afraid she might lose her job. So Mike immediately talked to her. We had her sign a photo release and took her picture, and thus goes the start to the photo petition for the east side of Oregon. Great job, guys. Oh, yeah, all right. Sorry. So, so what we have is we have to always be ready to meet with and engage with people. So we have to have the postcards. We should have the photo petition releases, which are an important organizing tool because not only do they give the release for the photo to be used for this sort of thing? But they have all the contact information on them. And when someone calls them, when I call somebody and say, hi, this is Mary from the Healthcare is a Human Right campaign. Remember at the farmer's market, I took your picture for the photo petition. Oh yeah, that's right. That's already the start of a relationship. When any of the dot med as hell doctors call the waitress and say, remember us, we took your, oh yes, she's gonna remember right away. So everything has to be ready. We actually wrote out a release in that case because we didn't have it. Everybody can, everybody can participate and feel a part of the campaign in this way because everybody is able to do this. And this demonstrates the power of the people because here are the people. Okay. So another tactic that we always use is storytelling. So, um, so we also heard, and we've, we've sort of mentioned this, that, that we need to frame this campaign around cost savings. And we heard, you know, your, our legislators have heard so many healthcare stories. We've heard plenty of healthcare stories. But we didn't think that was true, because if they had heard enough stories, they would have probably changed the healthcare system. Because these stories are, are, are pretty important. So we use stories in everything that we do. Whenever there's a hearing at the state house and they ask people to come give testimony, you know, we show up with hundreds of us, but then we don't just say, I agree that we should have universal health care. We have every single person start their testimony by telling their health care story. You know, big or small, really bad or just every day, everybody tells their story because everybody has a story. Um, we start our meetings this way. You know, at our organizing committee meetings, um, at, at any of our uh, events, we start just the way that this meeting started with each of us sharing why we're here what this healthcare system is, is looking like for us, for our families, for our neighbors, our communities. Um, we, we do letters to the editor. This has been a huge part of our campaign. Those letters also start by people sharing what this healthcare system is doing to them. Um, and that means that, that those stories are getting out into the community. It's not just a story on the news, but it's a story of your neighbor. When you open up that paper, you're, you're hearing what's actually happening right down the road. Um, we also make media out of our stories. So we have something that we call the Stories Project, where people go out with um, their cell phones, small cameras, flip cams, whatever we've got, and they actually collect testimonials from people all across the state um, telling their stories about how this healthcare system is broken and what it looks like for them. And so this is really important for a lot of reasons. Um, one is that it puts lived experience and, and what we're going through at the center of the debate, not just cost savings like we've talked about. Um, and it recognizes that we're the experts. So there's not, we don't need to bring in an expert to tell us that this healthcare system is broken. Every single one of us knows it because we're experiencing it. And that means that we're the experts both on why it's broken and what we should do about it. Um, and that reframes things a lot. Um, it also shows that the, it helps us have the people who are most affected lead this movement. And that's often a lot of people who, who don't have their voices heard right now. And it gets those voices heard. 
Um, it asks people to better understand their own story. So I know that there's a lot of people out there who think they're fine, who think, well, I've got health care right now, you know, it's pretty good through my job. But when we ask everybody to think about their own story, we start to understand, huh, well, maybe I'm one job loss away or one emergency room visit away from, from disaster in this healthcare system. So we each really understand better um, that, that we're here not just because we think it's a good idea, but because we have a stake in this too, every single one of us. Um, also, stories can move people in a way that facts and figures just can't on their own. You know, the, it's great that we have the facts and figures to, to um, complement all the stories that we're telling and show a bigger picture, but without those real stories, it's harder to move people. And then lastly, when our stories come into conflict with the dominant narrative, there's a, there's a story out there, right, about healthcare in this country. Who's heard that we have the best healthcare in the world? You know, or who's heard that if we had universal healthcare, we, we're gonna have death panels, we're gonna have rationing. Right? We've heard those stories, but when we start to tell our own stories, we realize, wow, that, that, that story cannot be true. Because if I can't go to the doctor, do we really have the best healthcare system in the world? If I have people denying the healthcare that I need, do we already have death panels? Right? So, so telling our stories is really important for us to be able to understand that that dominant narrative is not true. And, and that, that's, that's really important that we tell our story. Um, so the next one is about engaging power holders on our own terms. Um, we did this in a bunch of different ways. Um, the first one uh, was uh, actually we did, um, when we start, first started engaging the legislature, we held people's forums around the state um, with, our rep, with, uh, with our legislators, our representatives and our senators in the Vermont legislature. And we invited them to come to an event um, where they would sit on a panel and they would come and we would all be there and we would explain to them the agenda of the event and we would say okay welcome here's what we're going to do today first you're going to listen to us for an hour talk about what we're experiencing and our vision for a universal health care system and how the way that we want to see it work and then you'll have time to answer a few questions and this really flipped what normally happens on its head you know usually they invite we go to their hearings or their debates we have like one minute or 30 seconds to ask our question and they get to frame the debate and how everything gets discussed and this totally flipped that on its head we would ask them very specific questions like is health care a human right yes or no and get them on record as saying that and we could later hold them accountable we would ask them questions like um, uh, what obstacles do you see to implementing a universal health care system and how can we help you overcome those obstacles, right? <laughs> Not giving them a way out of saying that, like, we're going to do this. We've decided, we the people of Vermont have decided we're going to do this. There's no way around it, you know. It's just a matter of what are the obstacles and how are we going to work through them together. And we really uh, thought this was very effective. We did that both in people's forums, uh, in candidates' forums, when the candidates were running for the legislature. We did them in uh, accountability meetings in people's homes. Our members would invite the legislators to their homes to have these kinds of conversations. We would do them everywhere we could, um, in the state house, in the committee rooms. Um, and what this really did was it would reframe the role of government as working for the people. We elect them, they make the decisions, they're accountable to us. Um, we would set the agenda and ask them, and, and we would frame the debate and have the conversation on our own terms. And we could ask them direct questions and hold them accountable in the future when they, you know, weren't voting the right way or where we heard stories that, you know, they were um, saying things in the committee room at the State House. Then we could go back and because, you know, we had been there and heard them answer these questions before, hold them accountable to the responses that they gave. So another thing that we did that was uh, incredibly important to, um, to this campaign and to the worker center's work more broadly is that we do a lot of education and leadership development. Um, so we talked about this a little bit already. We did anti-racism trainings all over the state to build our analysis about these divide and rule tactics. Um, we do uh, something that's called Solidarity School. It's a three-day intensive organizing training, um, strategic uh, campaign planning, uh, and, you know, bringing an analysis of systems and capitalism and everything that's going on uh, and the economic system. Um, we have really skills-based capacity building workshops, how to be an organizer, how to, how to do media, how to write a press release, um, all of these types of things. And the reasons that we do this, first of all, it, it brings um, a common analysis so that we're all on the same page about what's really going on um, in our healthcare system and in the system more broadly. 
Um, it also connects our personal experiences with the healthcare system, not just to that greater, to that um, bigger system, but to a bigger movement. You know, the, the struggle for healthcare is not isolated. It's part of the struggle for justice everywhere. And so what, what we wanted to do is make sure that every single person who knew that they were a part of the Healthcare as a Human Right campaign knew that they were a part of that movement. So, you know, people in Vermont, uh, we, you know, we have partners in this, mo in this movement all over the country we, and all over the world. And we would bring that, uh, those uh, relationships as part of our educational leadership development. We had people who, who were struggling for healthcare in rural Vermont meeting up with, with people from the inner city of Baltimore who were fighting for livable wages in the inner harbor. And um, people started to understand that our struggle for health care in rural communities is the same as the struggle um, for livable wages in Baltimore. And that's not something that the people with power want us to realize, right? They want us to think that we are very different and we have different issues, but, but through this leadership development, we understand that this is part of a much bigger movement. Um, also, it's a ton of work to do, the, to do these campaigns and to, to make all this happen. And we, don't, we can't have that be you know, staff. We don't have the staff, first of all, and we, uh, we don't want it to be a staff-driven campaign. We need all of us to have the skills and the capacity to do this work, and that means that we have to build it, because we don't all come into these organizations with, with all the tools to do the work that we need to do. So we need to train everybody to be organizers. We need to train everybody to understand media and, and learn how to edit videos, and like I said, you know, be spokespeople. We need to build the capacities that we need um, in our organizations so that we can carry out this work for this struggle and for the many, many more struggles that we're going to be fighting, you know, as time goes on. And since our health care isn't for sale and neither are our votes, we don't pay a lot of money to hire lobbyists. We don't need them. We are our own lobbyists. So what we do is we have a people's team and that takes the place of all this lobbying stuff that people spend a lot of money on because it's the people who are going to hold their government accountable for whether their needs are being met. And one of the tools of the people's team and the entire healthcare as a human right movement are these red t-shirts because we can identify each other in a crowd. If you see a picture, you saw all the pictures with people in the red shirts, the people testifying, but it's not just when we're testifying. The people's team is in the state house all the time, wearing their red shirts, making notes about exactly what those legislators are saying or not saying about our health care. And then letting their constituents know if they're saying something that the people wouldn't like. And this is the people gaining the power rather than the lobbyists gaining the power. And it's really important. It shows that people can go up against that power that, pe that we think we can't. And we can tip the scales and we can say, no, you're not gonna buy our health care and votes. We're telling you we can win the policy fights because we are the people. And we get to tell you what we need because you work for us. This allows every single person in the campaign to emp be empowered and be able to do something about the people's team and the policy committee. And the local organizing committees are all supporting them every step of the way. No one is alone. We are all together and together we'll make a difference. And I know that you here in Oregon are gonna wanna organize your own local committees and I think you've got lots of good folks here to help you. So we're waiting for you to be next. So that's exactly right. One of our biggest tools in our toolbox was actually doing the statewide organizing. So in addition to having, you know, our people's team sitting in the committee rooms monitoring every conversation about healthcare throughout the legislative session, and then Mary, who's the chair of the policy committee, getting on the phone to analyze what happened in the legislature that day and report out to everyone. Um, we also had local organizing committees in every county of the state. This is where I live, down here. <laughs> that's Vermont. Um, and uh, <laughs> that's this is Mary. I can't reach where Sarah lives all the way up top. Um, <laughs> um, 
but uh, uh, this is the state of Vermont. And uh, we would have local organizing committees in every county doing the work in their local communities, but coordinated on a statewide basis with statewide committees for media, policy, education, and art. we even had an art committee at times, much, much more. Um, to make sure that the campaign was running in a coordinated basis, but also rooted in the local community, so that no matter who you were, no matter where you lived in Vermont, you could know someone who is a part of the healthcare is a human right campaign. This localizes the work and builds community. It builds visibility everywhere, so that it's not just in Montpelier and in the state house, but it's there. There's ways to engage um, right at home. Um, it means that we build relationships across common divides. I mean, I don't know how, uh, how it is here in this state, but in Vermont, you know, there's a big divide between Burlington and the rest of the state, and people think everyone's so different, but by coming together in a statewide movement, we're able to see that, as you know, Sarah illustrated, between Baltimore and Vermont, it happens just right within Vermont, how we can see our struggles in the Northeast Kingdom and our struggles in Burlington and our struggles in Bennington are the same and the solutions are the same. Um, so it means that we're able to organize and coordinate on a statewide basis and also put consist consistent pressure on our legislators everywhere. That when our legislators come home at the end of the session, they're meeting with their constituents and everyone's talking about the same five human rights principles and they go back to the state house and everyone else has heard it too. And so it's that coordinated pressure on a statewide basis. Okay, so what is next? <laughs> um, so we still have a lot of work to do, obviously. Um, so one of the things is that, uh, as we've mentioned, uh, there are going to be decisions being made about our healthcare system um, uh, for the next many, many years. So we're going to be engaged. We fought hard for the for the principle of participation because we know that it's not just a different type of healthcare situation uh, uh, system that we need, but actually we need to be the ones making the decisions about it. So now that we've won that the, those mechanisms for participation, we have a big responsibility to be actually participating um, in all of these decisions that are getting made over the next few years. So some of those decisions that we have to fight for, uh, one is for equitable financing. And Mary talked about this a little bit, that everybody needs to pay according to their ability to pay. And actually right now in Vermont, all of this past week while we've been here in Oregon, everybody in Vermont has been attending listening sessions all across the state about how our healthcare system is gonna be financed. So we, the people in Vermont are, of Vermont, are coming together to decide, do we wanna pay, pay for this uh, through a payroll tax or through a sales tax? No, we wanna pay for it it's through equitable, progressive financing, and people are, are holding strong to that idea. We're also fighting to make sure that there aren't barrier, payment barriers to care, so that there's not copays and deductibles as a way to finance this healthcare system. Um, we also are fighting um, for equitable access. So Mary also mentioned this, um, everybody needs to get whatever care they need and that's gonna be a struggle as we figure out the benefits package um, for this new healthcare system. Um, and this issue of immigration uh, is gonna come up again. So we're gonna keep fighting to make sure that universal means everyone, um, regardless of legal status or any other factor out there. Everybody's gonna have access to this healthcare system. <clears throat> So we also have a lot of opposition <laughs> that we're going to need to fight, um, and they are mounting their, their uh, forces. You know, this is a quote from um, the Vermont Insurance Agents Association. They say, it's a far cry from being implemented, we won't be pushovers. So they're ready to fight, and they've already started. Um, when there were key votes in the, in the legislature, they actually had all of their agents stop selling insurance and start calling all of their clients, at, telling them lies that, that this healthcare system was going to cost them 15% more than it costs now, and that they need to call their legislators right now and tell them that they opposed it. So they're figuring out how to organize too. So we have a lot that, that we need to fight back against. Um, we also uh, have uh, the insurance, so the insurance uh, industry in Vermont is very small, right? We don't, we're a tiny state, uh, we are already very well regulated, so the amount of profits that they actually make represents a very small part of the you know, national industry for insurance, but they are pouring a, a very, um, uh, the, the amount of resources that they're putting into Vermont to fight this do not match the market share that we represent in the insurance industry. Um, and you know, they're, they're basically pouring funding into these fake grassroots groups. Um, we call them AstroTurf because they're not real. Um, like the, uh, the, the one that they've started right now is called Vermonters for Healthcare Freedom. Lovely. Um, so, so we have a lot to fight back against. You know, IBM, one of the biggest employers in Vermont, keeps saying, oh, we're gonna leave, we're gonna leave, even though you know, IBM is, is actually uh, a self-insured company, so they're making a profit off of their employees' healthcare right now. Um, 
so is that really the kind of employer that we want in our state? Um, so, so we've got a lot to fight against, but, um, but we're, we're getting ready for the battle and we're building relationships across the country, like here in Oregon, so that we're all in this together to fight back. Um, we also realize that one of the biggest risks, now that we're going to have a health care system that's part of our state budget, um, is that our health care system is going to be pitted against the other things that our communities need. Already, we're seeing um, across the, this country, uh, we're hearing that our state budgets uh, you know, are, are running out and that we need to cut things that we have fought for um, generations ago and that, that that stuff is disappearing and being dismantled because we don't have enough money in our state budgets, right? So as we now have our, our universal health care system as part of our state budget, we actually need to change the whole way that we do budgets in Vermont so that we're not told, this is the amount of money that we've got, choose which things you want to cut. We are rejecting that and we're saying, no, actually we need to figure out what the needs of our communities are and we're going to build a budget to meet those needs. Yeah. Health care and everything else, <laughs> education, <laughs> mental health services, we will not be pitted against, against each other's needs um, for, for a a pot that is just too small. Um, and we're going to keep organizing. If we're going to do that, we're going to need a lot more power. And there are so many doors in Vermont that we have not yet knocked on, so many union meetings that we have not yet presented at, church groups who have not yet signed on to our campaign and gotten involved, um, and lots and lots of people out there who still have a role in this movement. And we're going to keep organizing them. Um, and then also, we're going to keep organizing with you guys. We believe that one of our next steps is seeing universal health care happen here in Oregon, too. So just before we go, I want to say that the next time we're looking forward to coming back here is for your victory party when you pass universal health care. And just before we go also, what do we want? Health care. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Healthcare. When do we want it? Now. Yes, thank you. You've been listening to the Vermont Workers' Center organizers Mary Garish, Kate Canelstein, and Sarah Weintraub. The title of their presentation is How We Won Health Care for All. In a moment, we'll continue with a question and answer session from their presentation. Mary Garish is the chair of the Vermont Workers' Center Policy Committee and was recently elected to the Center's Coordinating Committee. She has been involved in the Health Care is a Human Right campaign from the beginning. Kate Canelstein is a lead organizer with the Vermont Workers' Center, joining in 2007 as a student activist as a member of the Student Labor Action Project at the University of Vermont. She worked as a project organizer for the United Electrical Workers and has also been working from the beginning as part of the Health Care is a Human Right campaign. Sarah Weintraub is also a staff organizer with the Vermont Workers' Center. Prior to joining the center, she worked as an organizer in mobile home parks in rural Vermont. She has also worked throughout Vermont on the Health Care as a Human Right campaign and helped to initiate the Vermont Workers' Center People's University for Learning and Liberation, a project for building leadership skills and critical analysis through popular and political education. To find out more about the Vermont Workers' Center, please visit their website at workerscenter.org. This program was organized locally by the Oregon Single Payer Campaign and Portland Jobs with Justice. To find out more about the Oregon Single Payer Campaign, please visit their website at singlepayeroregon.org. You can also stay in touch with the Oregon Single Payer Campaign through their Facebook page. You can find out more about Portland Jobs with Justice by visiting their website at jwjpdx.org. And now we return to the question and answer session from the presentation. Mary Garish, Kate Canelstein, and Sarah Weintraub spoke at the Portland Community College Cascade Campus in Portland, Oregon on December 17, 2011. I wonder if you could just talk a little more specifically about the equitable financing and how that is, how you talked about handling that. How do you determine who's going to pay what? Um, how do you deal with the question of, well, people are going to move into the state to get good health care? 
Are you including dental care with your health care? Why did you choose Oregon? Actually, we invited them. Thanks. Okay, Mary, you want to answer the first couple? Yes, I will. I think somebody asked about the equity and financing. What's going on right now, as I think Sarah Kay pointed out, is listening sessions. They're where the legislators are listening to the people. There are basically three choices, even though there's probably a list of 12, but three basic choices that seemed to be popular. One was premiums and copays, which is not very popular at the sessions. And the sessions started before I left, and they're still continuing. And I understand they're going the same way, which is to be graduated progressive income tax for individuals and businesses, including some sort of a wealth tax. It's up to the legislators because it's a bottom-up power structure. We tell them it's got to be broad-based income and wealth tax. They make a proposal, and then the people say, that works or that doesn't work. So I hope that answers your question. The next question, I think, dealt with um, oh, people moving into the state. And we've really found that Vermont already has a fairly good health system compared to some states, and that same question arose. But almost any state that's made new benefits, there have been studies done by Public Assets Institute. People really don't do that. People can't afford to do that because if they have a job, they're not going to leave their job to move across the country to, for, to Vermont. If they're sick, they really can't afford to do it because they can't even pay their doctor bills. And there may be some movement from the border states, but that's okay because we think that a lot of employers are also going to come there and we'll have jobs for people. And uh, I think, was there a question on the benefits package and the dental also? And the benefits package is also going to be determined by the Green Mountain Care Board. And that, again, with public participation. However, the act does set mandatory minimums on certain things. For example, the coverage that the board decides on cannot be less than the current coverage that Medicaid recipients get. The other thing is that for folks with chronic illness, mental health illness, or substance abuse issues, there is to be no copay, and it's to be treated as primary preventative care. Preventative care also has no copays. And just to quickly say, we're in Oregon partly because Oregon Jobs with Justice chapters invited us to come here, but also partly because we believe in movement building. We met some of these great folks um, in DC for the Jobs with Justice conference a couple months ago, and we built relationships over the years. But everything that we've seen since we've been here says that Oregon has all of the makings for building a movement for universal health care and for democracy, and that we are very excited, and it, we just hope that you'll uh, take it and run with it. You talked about how the media cut cut out your uh, cut you out cut you out of the picture. Um, what kind of media are you using, or do you plan to use to overcome that issue and get those stories out there? And how did the healthcare community, specifically physicians, specifically specialist physicians, uh, respond to this campaign and participate? Um, same question, except with insurance companies. Okay, so the first question is about the media, and um, it's, it's, it's such an important lesson that the media um, boxed us out, and something I forgot to mention is actually that it wasn't just the mainstream media, it's also the progressive media in a lot of ways. So we, uh, we really are, are learning, like I said, we're, we have a media committee at the Worker Center um, that works on both existing media, because we have to, it, it's there and we have to keep getting our message out there the best that we can, but we are learning lots and lots of skills about making our own media. We actually just um, released a, a movie from the Vermont Worker Center called The Strength of the Storm about, um, about the impact of Hurricane Irene in Vermont, which has been devastating, and the response of communities organizing to have just recovery um, from that disaster, so you should definitely check that out. Um, but also, like I said, we're building those skills. We're also hoping that, um, I don't know if people know, but there's an opportunity for community groups to have radio 
um, new radio licenses right now um, with the uh, low power FM stations. So we're looking into getting our own radio station and just really learning, you know, we're still in the process of figuring it out, but we are committed to building our own media infrastructure. Um, videos like the ones that you saw, those weren't just to show you here in Oregon. We use those as, as tools throughout our campaign um, to talk to people about what was really happening in our state. Um, so another question was uh, about uh, the provider community in Vermont and, and how people responded. Um, just a story to show um, how providers feel about this, um, this issue. There, the, the legislature held hearings um, sort of by interest group. Um, the second year of, of the legislation was passed. They had one for the business community, one for providers, and one for everybody else. And, that the, one for, and the way they set them up was that they would take one for, one against, one for, one against they very quickly ran out of testimony against, and it was just testimony for, testimony for, testimony for. So that was pretty great. <laughs> um, there were a few providers um, who, who testified against the bill, and mostly they were specialists who made a lot of money who were talking about how they were, were worried about not making as much money as they make now. And when that testimony was, went up against primary care doctors and nurses and lots of other types of providers saying, we want to provide care to people. We don't want to be um, administrators. We don't want to make decisions based on what's covered by somebody's insurance plan. You know, we want to make decisions based on, based on what's best for our patients. Um, those testimonies were just so powerful compared to people saying, we're scared of losing you know, some of our, our very big already salaries. So, uh, and then, do you want to talk about insurance companies? Sure. And I do want to add one more thing. The other provider community that came out really strong in support of this um, was people who provide alternative medicine, not just your tradi you know, traditional Western medicine. And part of the reason for that is because in a healthcare system that's based on profit, there's not a lot of space for things that don't make a, you know, might not make the most money. Um, and so by taking the profit out of our healthcare system, the hope is that we open it up for all, for people, as Mary said, getting the kind of care that we need when we need it um, and getting access to that. Um, and in terms of how uh, the insurance industry reacted, well, they reacted in many of the ways that we expected, and Sarah um, uh, talked a little bit about that. The AstroTurf fake grassroots groups that, you know, are being formed and initiated by the insurance industry, having the insurance agents call, doing ads. I know I'm on Blue Cross Blue Shield in Vermont, and I got a letter in the mail talking about how nice and friendly the CEO is, and, you know, um, not talking anything about the millions of dollars of golden parachutes and all that stuff, but... Um, they reacted in the way that we expected them to react, and they will do that everywhere. And um, we did have people who had formerly worked on sort of the um, lower um, uh, levels of the insurance industry, the people who are on the ground, um, that actually, in many cases, don't get health care themselves even though they work for the insurance companies. Um, and so folks like that were very outspoken in supporting a universal health care system. And just one more thing about the insurance companies that I think is an important lesson for, for folks here and everywhere is that they didn't come right out and say, our, our health care system is great and we shouldn't change it. They knew that that wouldn't work because because people everywhere were, were experiencing how broken the healthcare system really was. So instead, their message was that we need to slow down, that we're going too fast, we're rushing into this. You know, and, and so that's important to, to be ready to counter that and, and to know that that's going to be their messaging. Very not, yeah, so, so they know what they're doing, and, and we need to be ready for those kinds of, of campaigns. You've been listening to the Vermont Workers' Center organizers, Mary Garish, Kate Canelstein, and Sarah Weintraub. The title of their presentation, How We Won Health Care for All. To find out more about the Vermont Workers' Center, please visit their website at workerscenter.org. This program was organized locally by the Oregon Single Payer Campaign and Portland Jobs with Justice. To find out more about the Oregon Single Payer Campaign, please visit their website at singlepayeroregon.org. And you can also stay in touch with the Oregon Single Payer Campaign through their Facebook page. And you can find out more about Portland Jobs with Justice by visiting their website at jwjpdx.org. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions of Portland, Oregon. To find out more about our work and to access our growing library of free on-demand streaming video and audio programs, please visit our website at pdxjustice.org. You'll find talks on a broad range of topics, from public education and U.S. foreign policy to reproductive rights and health care reform, from politics in sport 
to the assault on civil rights, and much, much more. And write to us with your questions and comments at pdxjustice at riseup.net. We'd love to hear from you. Many of our programs are available on DVD or Blu-ray video disc. Please write to us for ordering information. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, independent bookstores, and all forms of grassroots, democratic, community media.